Welcome to Post Doom, regenerative conversations exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I'm your host, Michael Dowd. This 45-minute conversation I had with Joanna Macy was recorded in February of 2021. As some of you may know, back a year and a half ago, Barbara Cecil and I had a post-Doom conversation with Joanna that's already been up on the website. And this was originally just going to be a catch-up call between the two of us as we've known each other for decades. But as we got into it, we both found it went to pretty magical places and so wanted to make it available on the post-Doom site as well. We titled the conversation, To Collapse Well. We begin with the previews. Preview one. It makes me so glad to be alive now. Uh, I wouldn't miss this. Yes. If, this if this is the last generation, yeah. then I'm glad to be here. Yes. Uh, this is this is the utmost. I feel so grateful yes. to uh, be alive now in this. And now here's someone I can say that to who really understands it. Yes. And preview two. I found that I was sort of struck, amazed that the people who had the courage to go into their anguish for the world, the despair, the outrage, and not numb it out, mm -hmm. but walk into that grief and dread and anger. There was sometimes a shift in the sense of identity. And, and that sense of identity became almost coextensive with Earth. Joanna, you have just put your finger on what Connie and I both consider the single most important thing related to just bringing everything together. Systems, deep ecology, ecology, indigeneity, the sense of, of, of a sense of self that includes a continuity with time, that the ancestors live in you, they speak to you in terms of how to be faithful to the future, to the descendants. This continuity of identity with time and continuity with identity with what I call the nested self, this the greening of the self or the enlarging of the self or whatever you want to talk about it. But it's not so much the dissolving of the sense as it is the ecologicalizing or, you know, whatever. So whereas the sense of self becomes one with ecology and one with evolution and time. And that in my experience- And it's what, perfectly I'm, possible. Yeah, it's more than possible. I think it's the key to facing extinction, the, even the possibility of extinction, even if you don't, if you don't want to grant that it's, that it's likely, it just granting the possibility, being able to deal with personal death, death of expectations, death of worldviews, death you're not, of... I, wait a minute. You're not recording this, are you? Just for my purposes, yes. Good, I want it because what's being said now, I want to hear again. The conversation begins. This, this is literally the second conversation among the post doom colleagues around how can we avoid the worst? Can we avoid the worst? Or certainly what can we do? But it's a bigger issue than just that. It's also how do we how do we collapse well? And how do we do so in a celebrational, religiously nourishing way, um, spiritually nourishing way? Well, where we continue to uh, learn and celebrate. Yes. And, yes. and offer and create. Yes. Yes. That we will be generative. Yes, exactly. As you ask us to, right yes. to the end. Yes. Yeah. That's the way we want to. Yeah. Well, let me just first say, uh, you're the first one besides me uh, that, uh, and so I'm just thrilled that you are instantly, as I was, uh, 
thinking about the storage pools of the irradiated fuel rods. Yes. With their intense, intense radiation. Yep. And their dependence on <laughs> electricity. Yes. And if they don't get it, they have these rescue pumps that'll work for three days. So, <laughs> but you're the first one. And I love you for that. Well, thank you. They, you, were, you were an inspiration for me decades ago on this topic. Oh, I'm just saying these storage pools all over the world. And yes. what we have to do right away is to uh, build solar around them to, we could do that in just a few months. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting because until you've actually thought through and learned from somebody who really has the knowledge, I've had somebody interact with me just literally in the last week and a half on the Reddit collapse. And he's, he's a nuclear engineer. I mean, this guy knows his stuff. Oh, and good. And he was educating me on things that I didn't know that was filling in some of the gaps of why the, the, you know, the, the, the nuclear power plants themselves are of far less danger and concern than the spent fuel pool, the rods in the pools. And he went on to actually tell me about some things that historically were within a few days. I'll cut and paste what he wrote. Yeah and send it to you. But within a few days of, of, of cascading catastrophes, for example, over, over Fukushima. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I've been in communication today with both Meg Wheatley and with Catherine Ingram, because I mentioned that I'd be talking with you about this topic. Um, and Meg and I had a similar conversation two days ago or three days ago. And the real challenge, it seems to all of us really, is how do you get people who have a political worldview and, 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 and just, just human nature denial, just the, the denial of that, which is supremely painful to even consider in any serious way, much less politicians that are going to be unelected if they, you know, uh, have something that their constituency won't, you know, I mean, how do you get them to prioritize something like this? It, it it's almost like you have to admit that the myth of perpetual progress is a false religion before you're even willing to entertain that we need to step up in an immediate way. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I'm actually grateful that Bill Gates and his new book is out. We just watched today his conversation with Anderson Cooper on 60 Minutes. And it's clear in that conversation that Gates and Anderson Cooper get, it, it, certainly you would not put this as, success is the um, the high probability thing. No, it's a very low probability and yet we have to do it. And so what I want to try to do is how to how to have a conversation, not to try to convert the techno optimist and the Kevin Kellys and the Elon Musks of the world um, and the Ray Kurzweil's, but to basically say, can we agree that there's at least a 20 to 30% chance that all of our techno fixes won't work or that there will be power grid failures in many places around the world that are gonna impact these, these spent fuel rods. If we can at least grant a, a 20 or maybe 30% chance of that possibility, then it becomes almost immoral to not do what we can as insurance that that not happen because it really is geological scale evil. It is, it is, wow. You have to, because uh, now, wouldn't isn't it helpful to look at Texas right now? Oh my goodness, yes. I and mean, I think that already shows. Who would have thought? The technological hubris, the idea that civilization in its industrial complex forms, and all the perks and benefits of that, and the food production of that, and the heat and warmth and coolness cool in the in the summer with the, with air conditioning the idea that that will always be there to spare us from the uh the raw elements of the living world that hubris we're seeing it chip away in some major ways such as in happening in texas right and now it becomes irresponsible in the extreme yes exactly and it becomes even uh, abandonment of 
your um, most basic concerns for human life. And that's why I want to try to appeal to religious leaders across the spectrum, different religions, that basically this is a moral issue. And it's about faithfulness and unfaithfulness to the future. It's about, it's about uh, responsibility and irresponsibility, reckless irresponsibility. And I think that moral, I think religious leaders, spiritual leaders are more, are more likely to frame it that way than secular folk who are almost phobic of morally laden language and even relationally oriented language, yeah. like our relationship to the future. Yeah, that's pretty pathetic how we have... Um, crippled our imagination moral imagination yes oh i like that phrase crippled our moral imagination i have a book that's going into its uh second edition and it's got the word hope in it active hope yeah it's actually the best-selling book uh i've ever authored or co-authored oh i have no doubt joanna you helped keep us in gas and food money we've probably sold a thousand copies of it <laughs> <laughs> uh so i'm just want to uh, i'm um my co-author who's in scotland mm -hmm. uh, is the one now who's sufficiently well he's a, a generation younger than right of course Right. So he's doing the actual fingers to the keyboard, but we talk incessantly, and um, the the scene is so has already changed. So in the last, it's been because uh, it came out in eleven ten years ago. Right. Yeah. So. And when even I, if you were going to write a, a second edition or a revision of that up until before the COVID era, that's a different time than now. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then I was so interested that uh, you were, it was um, when you changed your view about um, the outlook for humanity. That was December 3rd of 2012. Right. And I didn't read Act of Hope for the first time until, as I recall, February 2014. Mm -hmm. And the last two books, well, one is going to come out in May. That's a new edition and a total rewrite of World is Love or World is Self. That's a collection. Oh, that was one of my favorites, Joanna. So I, I loved that book. There were four sections, as I recall. And because I'm not a practicing Buddhist, there was two of them that I recommended to everybody probably in my life to read for a while. Oh. A number, a number of years. Yeah, well, it's... it's um both that and then the last book, which was called A Wild Love for the World, which was mostly other people talking. Mm -hmm, right. Um, and, but then I had a little, uh, a series of memories running through it. Yes, that wove them together, right. Personal accounts. And, um, and a, an important forward and afterward. And in the afterward to that, I said that I still look forward to a great turning because we don't want to have the global corporate capitalism be the last expression of our idea of a decent economy. Uh, but it will be... It will not proceed, but come with or after in the process of the collapse. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's... Because, it, you know, in the first 
years of talking about the great turning, everybody assumed me, that we could have it instead of a collapse. Exactly. exactly. But now, um, and certainly the last few years, it became clear that it would occur with, and you, as we walk through the rubble that's left with, from the collapse, we would be guided by uh, a commitment to this, a life sustaining, I prefer that to sustainable, a life sustaining yes. culture. Yes. So yeah. that, that clarity that that would, go, it goes hand in hand with collapse and my debt indebtedness to deep adaptation for that was um, present in the last and then the book that's just gonna come out, uh, which is, <laughs> I think everything gets a little bleaker. Well, I just wanna give you feedback. I had probably a dozen people over the course of many months who gave me feedback on, who, or just told me their experience about yours and my post-Doom conversation. And because Connie took a couple of components of, this, of the program, you know, of, of what you shared later on, but then put them as a preview where you were clear in sort of rethinking what does the great turning mean for you now? And I had, I must have had a dozen people over the course of eight or 10 months tell me how helpful they found that because they themselves oh, had found good. their own sense of, of a great turning and wondering even if that phrase, phraseology works anymore. But if it does, it certainly doesn't mean what it meant for them five years ago. That's right. It becomes, all, in a way, has a different kind of importance. As things fall apart around us, uh, where it becomes a vision and a compass and a star are like the North Sea guiding us. Right. And where and it has to because then you realize every damn thing about this corporate culture. I've just been reading new reports from uh, the tar sands in, in Fort McMurray and up there. I mean, and that it, it we are so, so totally ass backwards and <laughs> and and inhuman. Yes, exactly. I'm just, when I think of what we're still doing. Yes. Well, I, no, I, I, I just still fracking. Yes. Even with the Biden in the White House. Yes. Uh, no, it's it very much of an addiction at this point. I mean, I, I've been in the world of addiction recovery for 30 years, but it's very much of an addiction to petroleum. It's an addiction to electricity. And it's totally understandable. I'm not using addiction in a negative nyan nyan way, but like, of course, of course, of course, we have become habituated to the comfort, to the the possibilities, to what 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 has made what has improved our lives, or at least for many people in the privileged world. Um, and we are not going to let those, we'd have no evidence in human history of the volunteering of millions of people, sure, thousands, but not millions of people that are voluntarily willing to downshift, downgrade, you know, use less energy, less stuff. Are you that. sure about that? Well, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to be proven wrong. I'm a, I have no attachment to that. <laughs> All, what I do know is that the study that I have done in the last eight years on the progress regress boom and bust cultures and how civilizations and empires predictably collapse is that the oligarchy becomes unavoidable uh, in almost all situations there that the, the, those who have wealth and power seek to consolidate, consolidate it, seek to, you know, rape, the natural resources for all they can inevitably get more selfish yes yes and yes. and tighter and tighter morally and we become more uh we regress morally we regress right yeah let me i, I just want to read one paragraph i sent uh 
Catherine Ingram mentioning that we'd be talking. And I simply invited her. I said, you know, is there anything that you would advise that I asked Joanna about? Uh, and I even said, if you want to be on part of the call, uh, you'd be welcome. And so she said, well, thank you much for that offer. You, you know, you're always so generous and inclusive. I'm grateful for the amount of clear-eyed material you're posting. But alas, I have a Zoom board meeting at exactly the same time that you and Joanna be, will be talking. Mm. As far as a question that I could ask, the few questions that come to mind are probably inappropriate and contain within them the assumption of extinction. The last I knew of Joanna's work from a few years ago, she had the idea of a great turning as the third stage in her three-stage view. I hope that she's right, of course, but I see no signs of a great turning in a sustainable direction or even in a metaphorical or dharmic direction. The great turning that I see is into chaos that will lead to extinction. I see things getting darker in human behavior, more tribal, more desperate, for those at the bottom, which will include most of us soon, while the rich hoard the last of the major resources. I see the ecosystems being poisoned at an exponential rate, the heat ever rising, the oceans dying. I see people going mad, even within this COVID phase, which from a later vantage point will look like the good old days. I see resource wars, great and small, coming in all directions, nations, cities, towns, villages, neighborhoods. I'm not counting on human nature to pull us together. Human nature is really what terrifies me most. That said, I think that there may be pockets of civility that hold out a bit longer. The board meeting, for example, that I'll be attending today is an organization working on emergency and resilience plans for our Shire. Just playing for time, really. Any place that has carefully managed resources will probably be overrun by mobs who don't. This kind of mitigation is about all that's left for us to do, but it will not sustain. It may only extend the glide. All this said, I manage my attention and focus on the day's small joys. My only interest is in acceptance at this point, but that is still a work in progress. Love, Catherine. Uh, wow. Well, thank you for reading that to me. I have been... Um, I've always, I've been, put, and coming out of the Buddhist, of course, she's in Buddhist practice as well, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yes, very much so. Um, uh, with the uh, understanding and experience of the self. And I have found it probably the most meaningful thing in Buddhism is the understanding of the self, which is... Um, there is no separate permanent self. And that once you allow yourself to let that in and experience it, which I did with incredible glee and joy uh, and foundational to me when it happened, which was about 40 six years ago or over about 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it changed everything. And, uh, and so that uh, also made it easier for me and with systems theory and Gaia theory. Yes, exactly. Uh, I find it, it's just a natural thing to um, find growing a a um, planet sense of self, a Gaian sense of self, and have worked toward that for the last mm, 35 years with, you know, the Council of All Beings and the deep time work and all the experiential uh, work where we role play um, beings of vaster experience through time so that we can. Uh, and I've seen even before we got to doing that with our deep ecology work with John Seed and so forth, um, I have all noticed that in the very early days of the despair work, and you were around 
pretty early back then and yeah around boston yeah it must have been in the early very early 80s maybe even 80 itself yeah um, i don't think i experienced it, you to uh, until about 85 85 well and that's when uh i was in um deep ecology with john seed in australia mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that was just even before then i found that i was sort of struck amazed that the people who had the courage to go into their anguish for the world the despair the outrage and not numb it out but walk into that grief and dread and anger. There was sometimes a shift in the sense of identity. And, and that sense of identity became almost coextensive with Earth. Joanna, you have just put your finger on what Connie and I both consider the single most important thing related to just bringing everything together. Systems, deep ecology, ecology, indigeneity, the sense of, of, of a sense of self that includes a continuity with time, that the ancestors live in you, they speak to you in terms of how to be faithful to the future, to this descendants. This continuity of identity with time and continuity with identity with what I call the nested self, this the greening of the self or the enlarging of the self or whatever you want to talk about it. But it's not so much the dissolving of the sense as it is the ecologicalizing or, you know, whatever. So whereas the sense right. of self becomes one with ecology and one with evolution and time. And that in my experience- And it's what, perfectly uh, possible. Yeah, it's more than possible. I think it's the key to facing extinction, the, even the possibility of extinction, even if you don't, if you don't want to grant that it's, that it's likely, it just granting the possibility, being able to deal with personal death, death of expectations, death of worldviews, death you're not, of... I, wait a you're not recording this, are you? Just for my purposes, yes. Good, I want it because what's being said now, I want it here again what you're now is you're speaking from inside me as well yes 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 but that's this the piece is my greatest joy yes that's why i am so happy to be alive now yes yes well that's why world is lover world is self was so deeply meaningful to me because I had already awakened to the whole universe story. I had been a student of Thomas Berry since the early 1988 and, and, and really a student of indigenous ways around the same time, 87 or so. But that sense of the expanded or the greening of the self, both with time and with space, and then how that also gives one fearlessness with regards to mortality and impermanence. And those two things, this expanded identity and the fearlessness around mortality and, and, and death, those two things are, in my opinion, and Connie's too, the most central pieces that when people get that, they can face the chaos of our times from a whole different place. Oh, that's so good. Because that is what I experience. And yes. it makes me such a happy cookie. Yes. Is, yes. It is such a fulfillment. Yes, I completely it's agree. The best thing. It's the absolute wellspring of everything that gives me joy in being able to deal with the challenges of life, but from a place of relative equanimity, trust, and a passionate commitment to make as big a difference as I can, wherever I can, but with, without the fear of anything, because I know that my larger self in time and space continues. And, and, and what I feel too from this, because it's uh, it makes me 
so glad to be alive now. Uh, I wouldn't miss this. Yes. If, this if this is the last generation, yeah. then I'm glad to be here. Yes. Uh, this is this is the utmost. I feel so grateful yes. to uh, be alive now in this. And now here's someone I can say that to who really understands it. Yes. Yes. Because it's like a great harvesting. Yes, it is. I feel this exact same way with you. Oh. And it was actually this line of thinking and feeling and sense of identity that was what made the shift for me a year and a half ago when Miriam and Trevor were talking about the possibility of getting pregnant and I was filled with a lot of fear around that. And then I, in meditation, had this extraordinary breakthrough where this tsunami of trust just broke over top of me. And I started crying and crying and crying. And I realized oh, that even it. if this, even yeah. if this is the last generation to have children. If, if, if Miriam That's is a part okay. of the last generations of mother, what a sacred, incredible, There's would I not want her to have that? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Trust. I just, that something that is right at the core of life. Yes. I consider trust in reality to be a secular way of saying faith in God. It's trusting <laughs> what's, what's inescapably real. Oh, uh, yeah. And then I now see, now that Anjali is eight, or almost, actually she's, in two days, she'll be nine months old. She was born on May 20th. I see the way that Miriam and Trevor's lives have been transformed because they have this biological, spiritual being to live for that's greater than themselves. And I see the joy and the, the contribution and the sensitivity and the generosity and compassion that was elements was elemental in them prior, but now it's like fully flowered because of this baby. And neither one of them are in denial about the challenges. In fact, they're quite educated. Still, the human family is still here. We can't just stop having <laughs> babies because we see the end coming. No, we're going to be humans living as humans till the last. Right. And I have, and, yeah, and I, I have had some young men who are, who are who call themselves anti-natalists meaning that they believe it's immoral to bring children into the world today. And I've had some of them jump on me. Uh, and, and in fact, one, one person labeled me, well, he's just a pronatalist. I had to look it up. I, I, oh, it's because I love my grandchild. Okay, then guilty as accused, Your Honor. <laughs> no, it's just that when we go, they're going to be gorgeous one and two year olds you know yes. i mean just, this is this is humanity we're all ages yes exactly exactly and we would cease to be humanity if we said to ourselves well i figured this is the end so we'll stop reproducing no we are reproducing species and the lilies uh are with us to the end we're family to the end. What an incredible sacred honor to be alive at this time, at the, age, the end of the age of exuberance and the beginning of the great contraction, the great unraveling, um, and how to stay human and humane and generous and compassionate and service. I, I often say, and young people tend to find this pretty inspiring, that saints, sages, and heroes and sheroes are typically born in contracting, collapsing times, not in expanding times. And I think that we're seeing this already with some of the with some of the people who are stepping forward, not to save industrialism, but to be, in my tradition, Christian, Christ-like, to be a blessing to the future in ways that are sacrificial, knowing that the ship is going down, and yet we can still be divine humanly divine in the process. 
Well, I call, I, I remember seeing a play, gee, uh, 50 years ago, uh, about the Warsaw Ghetto. Mm. And uh, they were trapped there. They knew they were trapped. They couldn't get out and it was the end was coming. And uh, there was something in the play, it's something that happened that was so transcendent of, uh, to me, watching the play. And so I have caught, written it because I feel that there is part of the magic of life is that it is transforming and redemptive at every moment. Yes. Right to the end. Yes. Who we, we cannot uh, claim to be the judge or so wise as to know. Now it's we're finished with life. Yep. We're not going to be finished with the magic of life. Exactly. Until uh, it's totally. And how will we know when it's over? Right. Well, that's why I'm creating in uh, the main thing I'm doing this week and next, just, just so you know, is that um, throughout 2021, I'll be doing anywhere between two and three sermons a month, homilies a month, uh, you know, via Zoom. I don't have to travel anymore. I can do that in, you know, all different kinds of settings. And, th and that's become pretty easy to schedule those. But then after the 20 minute sermon, like within a week of that, like on Thursday night or Friday night or Saturday night, that the minister or administrator sends a link to one of my videos, not this one you just watched, but, uh, but one that I'm creating now this week, which is much more practical, uh, uh, practical tools, and it gives enough of the big picture so that people understand the nature of unstoppable collapse. They understand the nature of ecological overshoot. I'm including all of that because I want to provide not just the scary stuff, but just enough of that so that people have a sense of, oh, of course, of course, of course, this is the craziness we're seeing. But then ultimately, more than half the program is on sort of, like, okay, now what? You know, how do we be with each other in ways that are soul nourishing and generosity, you know, rippling out and compassionate and so forth? Because I think there's a lot that we can do to collapse well, to collapse humanely, to to be a blessing to our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, our family members, um, even in the midst of, of accelerating collapse of systems, of industrial systems that have never been sustainable. To collapse well. Yeah, how do we collapse well? How do we collapse compassionately and, and, and well? Yeah, well. Yeah. That's why lang uh, language I'm using these days is not just post doom, but also post gloom and post hope. Like, what does it mean to be in action in a loving, compassionate, generous way without hope being the thing that motivates us to do that? I mean, I still like active hope, but there yeah, the active part is qualifying. It's a hope that we can all die well. Yes. That's really oh, hope. that's beautiful, Joanna. I love that. The, the hope that we can collapse well, that we can die well. That's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And it's also a practical hope. Miriam, for example, understands all this, but she's specifically requested, and she didn't even need to request it. I'm totally there, of not reminding her on a weekly or monthly basis of this sort of large collapse stuff because she's got a baby to attend to and wants to be so fully present to the possibilities of being the best mother she can be and to raise this child. And what I said to somebody just last week, I said, I honestly don't expect my now nine month old granddaughter to live to be the age of 20. And yet I'm going to do everything to my dying breath to ensure that she lives life fully and loves the life she lives until the, and my daughter and son-in-law too, until the grim reaper comes for us in whatever form that may be. It makes me happy. Hmm. I just feel that uh, I'm making peace with this. Uh, makes room for such uh, f 
fulfillment somehow and mm. such. Well, the word that keeps coming to me is happiness. Mm. <laughs> Not even joy, just happy. Mm -hmm. So happy to have a chance to be with this beautiful planet. Mm -hmm. After this long, long story for these millions of years in the human story, and uh, and now we come, I get it. We get a chance to be here, right at this climax or this ending, and can we take our gratitude and love for this planet and? let it inform us to be as appropriate and uh, just damn grateful. Uh, you know, when, when my husband, a friend died, uh, we had first the funeral and then we had a memorial service and we loved telling and remembering and the stories and the music and there was so much to celebrate well we have so much to celebrate yes. of our earth i want us to uh, make the most wonderful celebrations to thank for rivers for mountains for you know uh, instead of feeling sorry for ourselves instead of wallowing in self-pity and complaint that's so tawdry you have just opened up an, a whole new door i mean your work and john seed and others but those in deep ecology and 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 connie's work i fell in love with her when she when i read green space green time the way of science because it had science-based rituals these, these naturalist rituals. And you have just, in what you just shared in the last four or five minutes, opened up a whole new inquiry, a possibility that I want to pursue at some point in the pretty near future, which is who's interested in a conversation about celebrating our relationship to place, the planet, the bioregions, to celebrating our place in evolution, not from the sense of that we're going to continue forever, but from the very real sense that we probably won't, certainly most of us won't, and doing so with that sense of absolute celebrational joy. I mean, I can imagine tears of gratitude, not tears of fear. Yes, yes. Wow. That's why we, you know, I expect when I kick the bucket that people are going to gather around and tell stories about me and then play this and relive that and have some good laughs and say lovely things. Uh, they're not going to complain about me. Well, why this fame for us? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we could remember too, some of the great people, the great poets, the great musicians. Yes. And I must want us to have festivals. I want us to go to um, just bays and inlets and the Sacramento River and the Mount Shasta and everything and say, well, glory be. <laughs> Otherwise, we, 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 then we could become something worthwhile. Yes, yes, yes. I love you so much, Joanna. You have been such a teacher, such a mentor, such a friend. Thank you. <laughs>